Good evening, everybody. Um, we've got a bunch of questions to get to tonight, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, the first one is from Justin, and Justin asks, do you use ridge vents in your hoop houses or tunnels? All right, so let's uh, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, I'm going to kind of sketch what a ridge vent is for you that might not know what that is. So um, normally a greenhouse is kind of shaped like this, and then it's got a ridge, and then it's got the other end like this. And most people put, most current hoop houses, they put some vents up here to let the hot air out the peak, and then they put a roll-up side that kind of goes four to six feet up like that. But you can also add a ridge vent. So a ridge vent would actually run right along the peak like here and actually vent all of that hot air right in the peak right there. Um, I don't see them necessary for houses that are 30 feet and smaller. It just, it's a lot of expense. There's a lot of steel up there. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for me. Um, definitely you can do it. They don't seal very well during the winter time. So there's a number of reasons why not to do them. But if you're going for something, you know, 34 or 42 feet wide, so the wider you go, going to 42, yes, you do want to put them there. The reason that is, is if you kind of look at the end, well, let's clean this off and kind of look at the end. If you look at the end right here, you've got your hot air, your cold air entering the sides. And so you got your vent right here, and that cooler goes through the crop canopy, then up and right out the top. So that's the beauty of that, especially for those super wide houses. This area right in the center can actually get dead, um, and so that it gets really hot, and your blossoms can be lost and that sort of thing. So that's why for the wider houses that works. But 15 foot wide houses, 30 foot wide houses, just good roll up sides on them should be plenty for what you're trying to do. So, all right, let's jump into the next question. The next question is from Adam. And Adam asks, um, been enjoying the video questions you've been answering. Thought I'd submit one. Uh, maybe it's too elementary. No questions too elementary. There's millions of answers to these questions. So <laughs> I'm just giving you my take. Um, if you're starting out breaking new ground, likely in sod for market garden use up to two to three acres, what process do you prefer to use to get started? Pay someone the mold board plow, turn it over with all the importance placed on some perverting soil structure. Do you tarp large swaths to kill sod and raise beds, broad fork, etc. directly after? Combination of both, or is there another method you prefer recommend? Planning on beginning larger production this fall, hopefully, and trying to decide how to get new ground ready for beds. All right, so great question. This is a, a really good question. Um, and there's no right answer. I mean, I've seen people recommend actually removing the side completely and going to work with the, the using the ground below that. And if you have, you know, two to three foot black, beautiful soil, that may not be a bad idea. Remove that sod, compost it, bring the compost back later point. Um, for us, though, those top two inches are where a lot of your biological activity is going on. So we try to preserve that. And again, we try to preserve our soil layers and stuff. But if you do have really thick soil, a good plowing is, is the way to go if you're st first starting off. So I like to see, you know, a good 9 to 12 inches with a big tractor, get that really turned over well. And if you do that, you can almost plant within three to four weeks. You're definitely going to have some sod coming back up, but if it's a good plowing job and you do a good job of like tilling it and disking it right away, you should not you should have a, a good, um, good that. It, sh it should do a pretty good job. Now, obviously, there is tarping it. So if you know far enough in advance that you're not going to be using the ground like six or eight months, go ahead and just tarp it for that length of time. Um, that will really kill it, break it up. And then you could also shallowly plow, which to me would be ideal. If you shallowly plow and then tarp, that to me is the best because it still turns that sod over, but it still allows um, the soil bacteria and stuff to be working in there. So one of the problems I've seen with tarping um, and just a general turning sod over is you generally have some issues with um, the sod not breaking down fast enough. So another thing to think about, I haven't done this personally, but I think this might be onto something here is to actually try to in, in bring in some compost or bring in some really good biological activity to go ahead and be able to 
help break that down. So something that's going to help break that down, maybe some more worms or something like that. But getting that sod broken down can be a challenge for that. Um, so yeah, you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, I do know some people that go ahead, break the ground, make the beds, and then just tarp it for four or five months just to get it ready. And, and that will really leave a nice, nice seed bed. One thing to think about, if you are going ahead and breaking new ground, don't plan on planting any potatoes or carrots in that ground because wire worms can be a real issue. So that's just one thing to think about in there. Um, let's see. So I hope I answered that. Let's see the next one question is so the next question is from Eliz uh, Rebecca Elizabeth Whiting. I have the opportunity to build a large high tunnel through a grant with the NRCS office. I've already gone through the approval process and I'm just waiting on the final go ahead, but that seems to be guaranteed at this point. Where is the best place to go about getting a good priced, large, sturdy high tunnel? I've been doing a lot of research on kits, but I'd like some first hand experience. We're in zone three with heavy snow and extreme weather, so sturdy is a must. Um, yeah, you've got some challenging um, zone three, heavy wind, um, heavy snow. Those are really challenging for high tunnels. And uh, what I would recommend is when you are looking at companies, look at the diameter of the pipe, look at the closeness of the bow spacing, look at the snow load they're rated for. Um, you probably wanna be going with four foot bow spacing at, with that much snow and wind. Um, and uh, lots of bracing extra rows of purlins, probably at least a two inch or two and three eighths at least pipe for that. So a couple companies I've you know worked with extensively and been very happy. And again, there's plenty more out there. So do your own research. There might be someone closer that produces a very good tunnel. Um, but we've always had good success with Harnois houses. Um, they're out of Canada. We had good success with Rimmel. They're out of, I believe, New Hampshire. And then we've also had good success with Four Season Tools out of Kansas City. Um, Four Season Tools is a lot more custom, a lot more movable stuff. And so they're, they're more expensive, but they do put a lot more weight in their tunnels. So a lot more steel, structural steel. Um, but again, Harnois is very good. Rimmel's very good. Um, just been happy with all three of those companies. Um, and again, there's other companies out there that I'm sure are great. I just don't have personal experience with them. All right. What else here? Let's go to the last question here. All right, so actually, second to last, I, uh, this is from Trisha Sim, Simkins Tom, um, Tipton. I see that many of you are pros at this, and I'm trying to expand my little homestead for providing all my family's own food to sell at Farmer's Market next year. What would be your best suggestion for a newbie to learn? I really have no one to help me. I'm, I've contacted my extension office. She just said they have this literature that I can read. I have the organic marketing book already. I don't want to bomb you all with a million questions as I know this site is more for those already in business. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, Trisha. This is the right place to learn. So I think the first thing would be is um, go for it. Just go for it. Jump in. Stay on these online groups and just watch and listen and read the comments and read the questions and um, watch what else is doing. That's always great. Um, I am going to suggest a few books, um, and don't you know get all over me for the books I didn't suggest. And there's a reason I'm not suggesting the main ones because everyone suggests those. So I'm going to suggest a few books that people usually don't suggest. And this, my reasoning is, um, you know, our mentors Paul and Sandy Arnold in Argyle, New York, always said that being a farmer is first being a marketer, second being a business person, and third being a farmer. So yeah, it's important to know how to farm, but your real importance comes down to knowing how to be a business person, knowing how to market your product. So um, I know a lot of poor, incredible farmers, but I know a lot of very rich marketers who farm poorly. So. Um, Let's get off to this one. To me, it's the Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. Golden here. Richard's a great guy. Has some great information. Um, and I'll link to this right below in the in the subtitle. Let's see. We've got the Fearless Farm Finances. Again, get your finances figured out. Figure out your marketing plan. Figure out your marketing. Um, third book is the Lean Farm. 
Um, and to me, this is incredibly key. One of the major things we do with clients is we help them figure out their systems. We walk on their farm, look at their systems, look at how their, their flow is, and that's where we make them the most money. Um, one Again, it's just it's key right here. Now, the fourth book, not even a farming book, but it's a classic, The E-Myth Revisited. So this to me is one a book that I try to read every single year, and it's incredibly important for a farmer to read because you got to realize you can't wear all the hats, and you got to figure out who's the best on your farm to wear those hats. So um, I know reading can be a challenge, especially if you're farming, so I really love Audible, and um, I'll have a link below. You can go check that out too. So listening to books on tape is just is the way I do it, man. Um, so obviously going out there, watching on the pages, reading some books, but then I'll also recommend go to farmers that are successful and watch them. Ask if they'll mentor you, but find those farm, not farmers who are complaining about the market conditions, complaining about how the world is never on their side, whose fields are full of weeds and who are barely making a buck. Go find the ones who are successful and learn from them because those are the ones who are actually crushing it and actually making it work in their system. So not that others can't teach you something, but I like to surround myself with people that are successful because that actually ups my game and makes me more successful. All right, hope I didn't ruffle too many feathers with that one. Um, and last question is, um, I am starting a roadside stand and trying to figure out how to keep everything cool at that stand. Um, how do you suggest we do this? So. Roadside stands can be great. Um, we on our farm just always work through farmers markets because that allowed us to only have to harvest a couple days a week and keep really incredibly fresh product for our customers. But if you want to do roadside stand, that's great. A couple ways I would go about this. If you have power, by all means, try to put out like a a like a two door old flower cooler or you know soft drink cooler or something like that. That's your best bet. That's keep stuff good for at least a week if you can hold that temp at like thirty four or 36 degrees. But if you don't have power, two other things you can do. Um, one is make sure your product coming out to your stand has been well cooled. So coming to your stand at 34 to 36 degrees is going to take a long time to warm up. And so then that'll be, be good there. Obviously, Swiss chard, broccoli, um, stuff like that can, and kale can go in, you know, with water at its base too. So stand those bunches up in the water. Um, other things you can put is in coolers. So some ice in the bottom, big igloo cooler, and then some pictures on the top of that of what's inside. So if you just say lettuce in cooler, people might not look at it, but there's a pretty picture of lettuce in a cooler. You're going to get sales for that. So, um, that to me is one of the big reasons why meat producers at farmers markets always have a hard time selling is with vegetables. You can throw all those out there. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Um, you know, people can eat with their eyes because that's what they do at farmers market. Um, but with meat, it's really hard to display that. So instead of your, if, unless you're, you know, cooking steaks on the grill for them to see, eat, um, sometimes those meat sales can be a little challenging unless you actually have really beautiful pictures or like a, or like a little freezers there with a clear top. They can actually see the cuts of meat in them. So, um, at our farmers market, we actually had a guy that, um, uh, they would bring four or six coolers, but they were always, if you said, oh, I want X, they were always digging in the back cooler, trying to find it in the bottom. And it took such a long time that they sold very little at that market because it would take 15, 20 minutes to get one piece of meat. So some of our customers would actually complain to us how long it took. So I guess I kind of ranted there, but um, the goal, you know, I was trying to say is show people what they're getting in those things. Try to, you know, at least let them see pictures of that product and uh, that might help with some sales on that. So, all right, guys, that is all for the night. Um, again, I'll list some of those book resources right below. So go ahead and, and grab those. And um, again, keep submitting those questions. They've been great, guys. I really appreciate it. And um, I've really been enjoying this. So go ahead, like, share, comment below, send some more questions in, and you have a great night.